Last Sunday night, a girl called Michaela became a Christian. But the thing was fascinating to me about it was watching her coming alive during the worship, during the teaching. You could see her actually coming to life. Now, going on from that, I asked somebody to reach out to help her to come to faith, you know, to counsel with her afterwards. And this, oh no, oh no, no, oh no, no. So somebody else did it, mercifully. They received the benefit and the privilege of sharing and introducing her to full life. Although she was already coming, it just needed that extra little bit of, sort of, a uh, bit like uh, Dorothy is working in the hospital, just bringing to life. Uh, baby comes to life, but, but it has to be looked after. All right. Lead us not into temptation. That's what the prayer that we know so well, everybody knows that. Now, uh, this is a Hebraism that is peculiar to the Hebrew way of thinking. The people of that land, the Eastern people. And James, in this epistle, in this practical epistle, sternly remarks that no man should ever say, no woman is tempted of God. God, he asserts, tempts no man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust. I think that's an incredible thing to, to say to us. It, it also gives us a high standing because it's saying we have to really be responsible for ourselves. We can't blame anybody else. Verse 14, a person is tempted when he is drawn away and trapped by his own evil desire. No contradiction here. Temptation is also testing. And God undoubtedly allows those who seek him to be tested and tried. That's the price of the value he puts upon us. That he allows us to be tested. And that comes in all sorts of ways extraordinary and very much ordinary and down to earth. Actively, God certainly does not entice us to evil. The altogether good God could not act in this way because that would be against his whole nature. God does nevertheless permit evil to operate and that's a fact of universal observation. The Hebrew thought tends not to distinguish between what God initiates and what God allows. But it's quite necessary for the Western mind to, to draw a clear distinction between God's directive and his permissive will, the things he points you to and the things that he allows to happen. Uh, the Hebrew thought everything was... Uh, coming from God, because he was omnipotent and saw the one who permitted the evil to come to be the author of that deed. Hence the strange statements in which Christians sometimes uh, get confused when it's, hmm, we did it not very long ago when we think about uh, Saul, Saul receiving an evil spirit from God, the king Saul that is. And actively, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, God was the initiator who introduced the, the moral and psychological laws against which Saul and Pharaoh offended. They had to endure the consequences of those laws being active. If you go against the law, there's a consequence to it. If I w go down the road and drive on the wrong side, then there's a consequence. I'll probably kill somebody or they, they'll kill me because I'm on the wrong side of the road. People are not expecting that to happen. But we should expect to be in a conflict for the rest of our lives about the things that we should do and the things we find ourselves doing. That's the struggle. We have to become fulfilled human beings. And the Lord has gone so far to rescue us. So, lead us not into temptation. Don't allow us to be tempted. Now, the great thing about testing 
in all the tests that come our way, God is going to be there with us right in the middle of it. He knows our weaknesses and we know his strength. And part of the passion of this prayer may be out of the Old Testament, uh, out of the um, Lord's Prayer, but he does not. Uh, don't bring us to the test. It, it's, it's getting us to the position where we've got to come before him because we know without him we're going to fail again. It's facing the system in our situation, the system in, of the life that we live in, the world system that is alien to the things of God, which makes us aware of the things that, that come out into our minds, that, that we don't want to be there. We're confronted by filth in all sorts of subtle ways. We can't avoid it. And we have to know how to deal with it, not how to pretend it's not there. We can avoid it, don't have to go looking for it, but today it seems to find us so easily. Yes, it can alter our whole life, a moment of temptation. It can poison all our happiness. It can assassinate all our joy. And yet it still happens because we can't calculate the, what the deed is going to entail. One of the temptations that we have is that, that, that that's the way to live. You know the Philistines, remember, uh, who was it? The guy with the hair, Samson. He was tempted by the culture of these brilliant refugees from Crete who are so cultured and sophisticated, more elegant and refined than the rather straight and narrow Hebrews. It was from living in the hills that he went down into Gaza. Of course, the price of his uh, defection eventually was he was betrayed and he was blinded by the Philistines. I take it, uh, this is unusual, but uh, it was in the washing up part of our lounge. Now, somebody put six cups in there, presumably had the coffee in that hadn't been used from last week and hadn't been got rid of, so it amalgamated at the bottom. Somebody put some water in this morning to try and get rid of it. But it's still there. And I was a bit shocked. You know what I'm like when I came in church, all in good humor. And uh, so, anyway, that's by the way. The great thing about sin, we should be shocked by it. We should be angry by it. The devil coaxes us into a false sense. Oh, it doesn't matter. Everybody does it. It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. If you don't go into that scene, you'll never know what life's like. Occasionally I talk to some of the young folk who loiter around on the street. One of the problems they always bring up, what about sex? But I said, what about it? still a giggly subject, even though people are supposed to know a lot more about it than maybe I did in my time, at their age. Sex is a great gift of God. It's brought low by the, maybe by the giggliness of man who doesn't know how to handle it and so he has to make fun of it. Something sacred has to be made fun of to, to handle it because it's too, too important otherwise. And I feel very sorry for the young person growing up in the modern world where, if you like, to, to dally with sexual activities is just, just like uh, learning how to play marbles. It really is something brought low. Whereas, in fact, engaging in a relationship is the greatest art in the world. Much better to befriend somebody than to have sexual experience with them. Much better. Friendship lasts a much longer time. God doesn't withhold any good thing in our lives for the whole of our life. Nothing that's good. He can't give anything to us that isn't worthy of that description. God asks us to be patient when, when something that's wholly good seems to be a long time coming to us. Some of us have to go under great pressure because we have to wait for so long for something to happen. Being able to stay our hand when we want to get something, when he can provide it.
given time. Do you know, I was saved from going off the rails this week, and that's the wrong word to use, I'm not on the railway, by some traffic lights. It may sound ridiculous to, to suggest that I ever work in this way. I don't normally, but I did on this occasion. I've been reading a book, and this had brought it into my mind. And I said to myself, if that light changes to green before I get to it, I won't go to where I'm going. <laughs> you know, within five seconds before I'd started, I'd, I was, it had changed. That was it. Now, that was incredibly important to me because for me that was a fleece, not the sort of fleece that I put before God normally. But it had been put into my mind, so, so I used it. You can work together with God on anything, you can use any opportunity. I found that very powerful. That was a direction from God for me, a very powerful direction. It may have seemed a small way of, of using robot lights, but, but the Lord answered very quickly. I timed those lights. They normally take a minute. That one took five seconds. <laughs> That's this week. So when you're talking about, Lord, don't bring me to the test, put the test before the Lord and ask for his blessing on your life at the moment you're in this particular situation where you're going to do that. See if the Lord's going to be thrilled by you doing it. That's an incredible, powerful test. And he'll bring you through it if you let him. It says here, doesn't it, in verse 15, it's a beautiful way of putting it. This evil desire conceives. There has to be a beginning. There has to be a little contact. But then it gives birth to sin. It has to develop. And to develop as a human being, to be a fulfilled character in, 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 in the human race, it takes time. So grow the things that are worth growing in your life. Because weeds are a hell of a thing to get rid of, to use a biblical phrase. A weed is very strong. Don't let it grow in your life. Kill it. Strength comes from victory. When you conquer, then the next time you're going to be stronger. The next time you're going to be stronger. If you keep failing all the time, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. The devil takes great delight in your weakness. He says, oh, no, God's abandoned you. You're not wanted anymore. That's never true. You're always wanted. But why not receive his strength? C.S. Lewis, that very famous uh, lay theologian, you might call him, who's done more maybe than anybody else in the 20th century to make the Christian message appealing to anybody who's got a mind to think about it. His book that described his conversion, and it was called Surprised by Joy. He came to, to the Lord fighting tooth and nail all the way right up to the time he was converted. So don't be frightened to fight for the person that you love to come to Christ until they come, and then beyond that. But he puts this in one of his fantasies about this uh, wanting to deal with sin or not. On the borderlands of heaven and the denizens of hell between the two, the twilight slum in the drizzling winter rain meet, if they will, the spirits of the blessed and could have good at the hands of the angels if they so desired. In other words, these wispy creatures call them human beings. Waiting to be helped or not. And Lewis pictures this thin, murky, ghost-like figure with a red lizard on his shoulder. That made all of you shake, particularly the ladies. Whispering uncleanness in his ear. Confidence of which the visitor professes embarrassment in the clean and healthy presence of the good. That's interesting, isn't it, really? That when you're in good company, things that are wrong in your life, you don't want to know them, really. A grand and burning presence draws near the departing waif. Off so soon, says the mighty angel. Yes, 
says the little waif. It's this little chap. He won't stop. Would you like me to make him quiet? To kill him? asks the angel. He advances, hands out. But the pale little figure shrinks back and makes excuses, whimpers, retreats. Why, he cries, didn't you kill it without asking me? Or kill it gradually? Or just learn to let me tame it? Or wait till a more convenient occasion? Can you not hear the things that come across our minds when we're dealing with something that has to be dealt with? How reluctant we are to let God have his way. Relentlessly, the angel presses him. Of course it will hurt. But I cannot kill the thing without your consent. Uh, I have to quote, uh, what's her name? Uh, Lynn, Lynn Rycroft sitting at the back. She won't like me for this, but I've never been one to be worried about being liked, as you know. And uh, <laughs> she's had a boil under her arm. A really painful thing, agonizing. She's very reluctant to go to the doctors. And so I went and tried to provoke her to go, but eventually we got at least some, uh, some contact with the doctor, etc. Of course it will hurt. Can I have permission to lance your boil, Mrs? I'll do it myself. Yes. When will you do it? <laughs> I'll wait till it bursts. Okay, fair enough. You know what happens? The Lord's there. You're his personal concern. He's waiting to help you to be what you really want to be. To walk in his way, to walk in the light of his love. And the thing that's really got a grip on you, you keep, you know, oh, what's it going to be like without him? How can I live without her? That's one thought, a very powerful thought. A human being. How can I live without her? There's one guy at this moment who worships here occasionally who's really struggling. He can't live without a girl who's a total disaster. If she was dead and buried, he would be absolutely rejoicing now. But he can't get her out of his system. And therefore the Lord can't help him because his help has got to come from this girl. He's not a fool for Christ. He's a fool for not trusting Christ to heal the wound in his life, of which this is merely a symptom. Have I permission to deal with your sin, says the Lord? Will you give me permission to deal with your shortcomings in your life? Will you give me permission to deal with your faithlessness? Your lack of trust in my glorious power to make you into a man or woman of my choice. Do you want to crawl around on the ground forever apologizing for being a soft sort of Christian? Or a lame churchgoer? Eventually, this little waif consents. And the hand closes on the little and flings it broken backed on the ground. And the, sh the waif shrieked in pain. But then becomes something substantial and solid and real. A muscular young man. What potential is in you to become something beautiful for God? Something radiant. Something glorious that people can... can can wonder at and, and be amazed. How can she be like that in her situation? Isn't she a Christian? Now oh, that must be the explanation. Sin is often the perversion of that which is good. And the point of our praying should not be simply to resist, not simply to win a victory, but to be transformed. To become something that without God's help we could never be. 
not to be reformed, but to be transformed. Our prayer each day is incomplete without facing known weaknesses in our constitution. Put them before the Lord. Not necessarily every day, but some day of, of each week. A daily contemplation of your real self and the stresses and strains and allurements of modern life. Don't tolerate any secret sabotaging of God's plan for your life. Trust Him. Don't give a foothold to anything that can bring catastrophe. Don't tolerate that lizard on your shoulder. Now that second lesson that we had, and with this I close, had Jeremiah, great prophet, talking about they have healed the wound of my people lightly. In this version it says like a scratch. Only God can heal the wounded. He doesn't treat us in a superficial way. He doesn't gloss over the things that are really wrong in our lives. He didn't heal Festic of injury by saying, well, there's nothing really wrong with you. You've only had mumps. He had cancer of the blood, a killer disease. I'd love to have been around to hear Festo's prayer. Not for his own life, but for the Lord's will to be done in his life. And the glorious thank you prayers that will be going up this last week when he found himself delivered. Abraham was called that in him all the nations of the earth should be blessed. And to fulfill that, Jesus came as a light to lighten the Gentiles. But in the period between Abraham and Jesus' coming, a violent distortion had taken place in the thinking of the Jewish people. They had forgotten they were elected to be the people of God because they had a mission. They had forgotten that God had chosen them to be a people for himself only in order through them all peoples might be brought to God. They had forgotten that God's call to them was not a guarantee of their salvation. Who are you bringing light to in your life? Whose load are you lightening by bearing it with them? Now you can only do that when you're operating at full strength with all the strength that God supplies. To those who belong to him. This morning, let each one of us take sin very seriously. Let us not blame anyone but ourselves. Although often, as it says, it takes two to tango, sometimes we are responsible for somebody else's sin as they are responsible for ours in that we both allow sin to escalate in our lives, something to happen, that if one of us say, no, I will not do that, then it wouldn't have gone on. And even when you've been operating in a particular way for a certain time, the sooner you shut it off and say, no, this is wrong, before God it is wrong. Remember that sin keeps the shadow and the light of God shining upon us. The devil wants to keep us in the dark. Jesus always brings us into the light. And so I close with verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. The Lord will never blank out your life. Even when you're going really against him, he still loves you.
He loves to come in and rescue you, as the word Jesus means. By his own will, he brought us into being through the word of truth, so that we should have first place among all his creatures. There's nothing so beautiful as a man or a woman fully responding to the image that God has placed in them. And he's placed his image in you. You're of his likeness. You've got a family likeness to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever is in you at this moment that is against his will for you, give it to him at this moment. Maybe a lack of faith. Maybe your greediness. Maybe your selfishness. Maybe your harshness to someone else. Maybe your self-pity, a sort of own goal that we score often in our lives. Maybe because of somebody else we get sidetracked, when in fact we can put them on the straight and narrow way by being able to stand up against all the temptations that come our way. The Lord is in the creation business and the recreation business. He's not interested in reforming us. He is interested in transforming us, making us something that by ourselves we cannot be. Otherwise, we're left to do the best we can, which is not good enough. Do you remember the Indian Empire? Remember the test in India when, when the empires were going wrong? and Gatting was going violently wrong for whatever reason. Not cricket, you know, didn't play it. And one of the lovely phrases that uh, came out of it, a storm in a cup of tea, an Indian way of saying a storm in a teacup. <laughs> Sin is not a storm in a teacup. It makes an indelible imprint on our lives. Let the Lord deal with it now. Let's just have a minute now when whatever is in our hearts that needs to be dealt with at this moment can be dealt with. And the Spirit of God stretches out in his beautiful way to, to reach it and take it away from you. Let's do that. Our Father and our God, we just thank you for meeting the request that we've made of you. Take it away, Lord. Help us to resist and overcome. Heavenly Father, we love you. Because you first loved us. May we go on loving you, Lord, for the rest of our lives. For your glory in Christ Jesus. Amen.